Thank you so much for the kind of introduction. Um, let it be known that uh, when you're no longer Eileen's boss, she will comment on your hygiene and uh, give you soap, dope on a rope, so to not be smoked, but to be soaked. So I'm very uh, happy to come back to uh, doing a bylabs and talk to you about what we're doing. Um, this is a bit of a serendipitous presentation in that uh, two of our fields that we've been working in have recently merged somewhat unexpectedly. Uh, we do a lot of DNA sequencing clinically for patients with epilepsy, autism, and developmental delay, and you've probably seen in the news that many of these patients are sometimes desperately turning to cannabidiol, a nine psychoactive component of the cannabis plant. And I want to uh, just illustrate some of this through one particular patient um, that wasn't exactly uh, an epilepsy-based patient, but it, it was variants in genes that are commonly found in epilepsy. So there are some uh, analogies in channelopathies between heart disease, particularly arrhythmias, and in seizures. And, and in some ways, you have to consider sometimes a, uh, an arrhythmia as almost a seizure of the heart. It's an electrical misfiring sometimes with calcium and potassium and sodium channels. And these things can create EKGs, which look very similar to uh, what you might see from uh, you know, a, uh, a multi-channel EEG. So this is one patient that had three different types of EKGs that they couldn't drug with calcium channels or beta blockers. It was an idiosyncratic case where the patient was stuck in bradycardia, but it would come and go. And so after a long period of time, we ended up sequencing the whole family, uh, only to discover what type of variants they had that actually led us down a path to using cannabidiol, which we had seen so much success with similar channelopathies in epilepsy. Um, so we... we um, we do tend to focus on, a, on, on mitochondrial disease, and the only reason I bring this up is that this is where we think cannabidiol is actually targeting. It's a, it's a VDAC1 receptor, we believe, although it does have many different targets in the, in the human genome. Uh, this is one that uh, we think links many of these together, which is that uh, we're seeing uh, mitochondrial dysfunction in epilepsy and obviously mito disease, but also in autism and developmental delay. So uh, this is an area where we, we try to view, it's a portal that we try to view the genome through, which is whenever the Krebs cycle is dysfunctioning, what happens uh, and, and what pathways can be uh, disturbed by that? So that we tend to focus on those particular genes. And there are, in fact, multiple different genetic indications or contraindications based on different genotypes uh, for epilepsy. So the most common one you may hear of is SCN1A. It's a sodium channel. Okay, this one happens to be uh, a signature for Dravet syndrome, and these patients tend to be drug resistant. They tend to get cycled through about 20 different antileptic drugs. Um, oftentimes, uh, they, res they resolve them on three, but a, a good 30% of them stay drug resistant their entire lives. Now, this is a very dangerous form of epilepsy in that it can lead to SUDEP, which is sudden unexplained death from epilepsy, often thought to be a seizure that hits the brainstem and travels to the heart and seizes the heart. Um, there are other variants. Um, now, just as a side note here, SCN1A, Dravet patients, there's an ongoing clinical trial from GW Pharmaceuticals, and they are uh, extracting cannabidiol from the plant and giving this, this botanical drug uh, extract to the patients, and they're having a remarkable success rate in the clinical trials. It's still early. The double-blind placebo control trial is just starting, but the open-label one has been seeing a good 30% reduction in seizure rate. 20% of the patients are having complete seizure freedom, which is remarkable. The next closest drug to do this was gabapentin and had about a 1% seizure freedom rate. So it's, it's, a, it's a very exciting drug in the epilepsy field uh, and seems to be fairly non-toxic. Now, there are other variants we have to keep an eye on whenever we sequence an epileptic patient. GLUT1 variants uh, are usually in, 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 uh, indicative that you'll respond well to a ketogenic diet. POLG variants, uh, if you combine that with vel velproic acid, you can end up getting hepatotoxicity. So this is one that's a red flag. If you see any POLG variants, they can have uh, BPA. Um, there's some, there are other literature pieces out there about GABA receptors and steripentol. I think the real critical thing here is we need to understand the P450 genetics in most patients because when they're on multiple drugs, there's usually drug-drug interactions. 
And this is particularly pertinent to, uh, to CBD. It actually turns off CYP2C19 and CYP384 and 5. So if you're on clobazam, you have a, you have a problem. Clobazam is a prodrug that requires those same enzymes to get metabolized. So we are seeing some cases of desmethoclobazam elevation, uh, elevation in a lot of the patients when they put them on CBD. Um, but this becomes a, a complex picture when they're on three of these different drugs. Uh, and then there's a handful of other calcium variants as well that play a role in the change of the phenotype of Dravet. So in all, we sequence 500 genes, genes to get a better picture of this and perhaps help guide uh, patients through, their, through the course here of different, uh, different drugs and what they select. But for this one particular patient that we were going to touch on with heart disease, um, this was a relatively late onset. It was a 40-year-old male with atrial fibrillation. Uh, this was not a structural heart disease in that it was a vegetarian with low cholesterol and second-degree black belt, very uh, in good shape. But prior history of palpitations being brought on by ethanol, caffeine, and stress. This person works at a startup. His day is filled with ethanol, caffeine, and stress. Uh, and so uh, this was a, a clear contraindication uh, and wasn't, probably wasn't going to go away. Um, but one of the challenges you have in this is capturing this material. If you have to go to the hospital every time and, and get rigged up to an EKG, you often miss the events. And anyone who wants to ablate an event needs to see the event. And the cardiologist really want to be able to see these events and capture them so they could see if they could map them and ablate. So these little mobile devices came into play. Actually, I have one in my bag. I'll send it around later. But they're, um, they're really interesting EKGs that you can get a readout on an iPhone. It's about 150 bucks, and you can carry that around and hopefully capture some of these. Uh, and that actually aided tremendously in this because we were able to capture more of these events. Uh, unfortunately, since the events were so polymorphic, giving us, in some cases, VTAC, uh, we had to be, uh, I'd say the cardiologists were, were worried about ablating this. They wouldn't be able to map it, and the ablation wouldn't work. Uh, the drugs didn't work either. This, this bradycardia thing left them in bed quite a bit. Uh, and so we looked at alternatives. Now, the first alternative was to sequence exomes. I'm going to, you know, this audience knows exome sequencing. I won't spend any time on this. I think the real um, important piece here is that the vast majority of the patients we see end up in genetic purgatory, which is between the VUS and the pathogenic. And I think this is going to be a problem for the next five years until more and more data is shared. We get a lot of patients where we see something that's partially pathogenic. We've never seen it before. And until we find another patient that has the same phenotype, it's, it sits in that purgatory. Uh, and there's a couple of variants in this patient that were just like that. Um, we do want us in the cloud, but that's no, no news. I think the, the most uh, important thing we still tend to drone on about here is that uh, we tend to start with panels. Uh, and we do this because we see panels get, uh, get much more coverage from a depth standpoint. So we can get deeper coverage for better endo detection. And we can also get deeper co cover for mosaicism. We're not looking for mosaicism in this case, but in a lot of neurological diseases we are. Uh, but even subtle changes in a couple percent on the C20 mean a big difference when you invert those numbers. We've seen some exomes published at 92% C20s. That's one in 12 bases that are undersampled, in our opinion, uh, and maybe 67% that are undersampled for, X per, for indels. We like to see 100x coverage for the indels. Um, and the gene panels can push these things out to 98%. And we think it's important because this, these indels have been a clinical blind spot for a long time. You're seeing a lot of clinical labs not report any indels bigger than five bases. And if they're heterozygous, they even put question marks on them. But now with these longer reads we have, with 250 or 300 base pair reads, this window is going to open. And we should be, have a much better time collecting these insertions and deletions uh, in the clinical lab. This here is a ClinVar indel frequency. And so you can see it's a log scale there. There's quite a number of indels that are clinically relevant in, in ClinVar that are below what MLPA or Exxon CGH might pick up, but are within the grasp of a, of a long read sequencer. So we're paying a lot. This is one of the reasons we stay at MISeqs. We haven't moved over to the other machines because the read lengths haven't quite gone out there yet. I think they are now, but they weren't there a few years ago. Uh, and this is just a table to remind you that sometimes when people are even using 50 MERS, which we used to do on solid, it can really challenge the sensitivity for the indels. So um, the read lengths we do see playing a role. Now, in this case, we started with panels, and we found variants in two genes that were calcium-related. We did reflex to exomes to make sure we didn't see anything else. Uh, and I think maybe one other variant in the CAC NA1C gene did show up. So this is five variants that we found. Two of them are common, though. So those you usually rule out. Uh, but they may be playing some kind of modifier role. But both of them are in calcium channels, OK? Sorry for the effect there. It's meant to be a, uh, an arrhythmia. Uh, but these, uh, these uh, calcium genes, when they light up in one uh, in, one, in one particular pathway like this, uh, they, this is the only reason why this really stuck out. We had a couple rare hits in here. 
But as you will see, um, this is the world of a man with three watches who always wants a fourth watch. This is what we do in clinical sequencing is that we end up using four or five different prediction tools that are 2D prediction tools, and they're not particularly good. Um, so we go through uh, SIFT and we go through Polyfen, and we then look at evolutionary conservation all the way back to lamprey. And so in the case of this RYR2 event, it was very pathogenic by all the algorithms and very conserved. Um, but if you read the papers on, on the false positives to, to true positive rates of these, these aren't very attractive curves. So you really want like a right angle bracket on, on these curves. And these, you can see that where there's 60% true positive and 40% false positive rates, these leave a lot to be desired. Uh, this is why we run four of them and try and find patterns. It looks like we're up to five now. We've got another one in here called the CAD score that came out of Jason Jerry's lab. Uh, when these don't give us perfect um, confidence, uh, we try to dig into the cell circuitry and look at the 3D structure of these things uh, because it's difficult to map a 2D prediction tool into a three-dimensional three environment, particularly when you're dealing with pores or receptors. So what we have here is an ROIR2 uh, mutation. This is effectively a calcium-induced calcium response. This receptor sits on the sarcoplasmic reticulum it, that is filled with calcium, and when an ca intracellular calcium gets to a certain level, it rotates open and floods the cell with calcium and creates a contraction. So this is, what is, this is the metronome of the heart, basically. This thing is required to get the heart muscles to pump. And variants in here, uh, and we happen to highlight uh, where, on this, uh, where on this actual receptor this variant is, it's actually right near the hinge point where this thing rotates. Um, so that's another concern that we have. Uh, it also happens to be in this highly conserved region. These are all the different variants that we've seen in, in, in the databases. And ours is sitting, this, this P2566S is sitting right in a highly conserved area. Um, and when we map this against all the other patients we've ever seen, we've gone, been through about 4,000 patients at Cortigen, uh, we do find a couple other hits in this gene in cyclic vomiting syndrome and in PANS. Some of these patients have POTS, which is a form of uh, tachycardia that happens if you stand up too quickly. So, uh, but again, nothing that's identical to the mutation, so you can't, you can't draw those, those correlations. You really have to go back to the family, see if it segregates. And in fact, we are seeing here that it's segregating a little bit of the family, but the family's small. We've got six patients in this family. Uh, this is not a tremendous amount of power. Um, so we then turn to the other gene that came down the, the paternal line. The RYR2 turned out to be maternal, and the mother doesn't have that much uh, symptoms, and the father does. So this particular gene had three hits very close together, and this happens to be a, a cell surface um, voltage-gated channel that pumps calcium into the cell. So both of these things are in communication with each other. In fact, this gene happens to have an RYR2 binding domain. So these are in direct communication. One's pumping calcium into the cell. One's in control of the SARC, releasing it for contraction. Uh, five variants in this. Maybe this is the reason this patient isn't responding. Um, and this one actually tracks more with the phenotype. We end up having the father who has a very similar set of variants uh, as, uh, as the patients that are um, having the arrhythmias. There's actually a brother who's actually having arrhythmias as well. Um, and you'll see one of these is a methionine, although it's fairly common. It's a methionine to valine switch, and the other one's a rare variant. Uh, and when we look at where this falls, this is a mouse interpretation. We don't have this data on human, but there is an internal exonic promoter there that uh, is in charge of regulating the expression of this gene and having some interplay with the C terminus. So um, all in all, what do we do about this? We don't know. We have what could be leaking in two directions. Uh, we could have it broken such that uh, they're opposing each other, and maybe this is why calcium channel blockers are having opposite effects on both receptors, because they do hit both receptors. Or they could be in you know, another arrangement. So this made us think, all right, why don't we target something else? Let's target something that actually hits the mitochondria. The mitochondria is known to be a buffer for calcium. It actually soaks up calcium when it's too high and spits it out when it's too low. Maybe that's a more attractive approach. And maybe this is what uh, we're seeing in epilepsy. In fact, there are papers that, uh, that you can dig up that say cannabidiol targets mitochondria, regulate intracellular calcium. It's great stuff from Duncan Ryan's lab. And this leads you down a rabbit hole of a dozen other papers that demonstrate people using this in cardiac arrhythmias. Um, and so this led the patient, I won't hit you with all of these due to time, um, but hopefully we'll be able to capture them for, uh, uh, for later review. Um, but this does, in fact, show that randonin receptors are often into the cannabinoid mobilization as well, and we have some connections to VDAC1. So it's not out of the realm of possibilities this might help with rhythm problems. Now, the real problem with it is that you can't source it in the United States. It's very difficult to find this stuff. Uh, most people are growing cannabis for THC, for recreational purposes, and CBD is uh, actually very rare to find. 
Uh, there's a lot of people selling snake oil on the internet. They claim it's hemp oil. And if you go and test it, you'll find out there's nothing in it. It just tastes like olive oil. So uh, you have to run and, and run some tests on these things. They're typically done with HPLCs. Uh, and uh, we were confirming these with thin layer chromatography whenever we got a batch in, just to make sure it wasn't anything that was uh, uh, unexpected. And the patient titrated this up to three times daily of 25 mg. It's oral mucosal, and that's very important to, to know as well. You don't want to be smoking 75 milligrams a day, because you'll never know if you're actually getting 75 milligrams a day. Uh, and when you eat this, pro you probably get 6% bioavailability through your liver, because your liver enzyme knocks out most of it. Uh, and uh, when it goes through your mouth, you can get about 20% of it through your oral mucosal. So there's a biphasic administration when you take it orally. And you want to be careful with other things people put in this. A lot of people put, like, peppermint in it. Well, peppermint is prorhythmic. And you don't want peppermint inside of uh, an, an extract like this. And then the other thing you've got to worry about is grape juice juice or pomegranate juice. Those things knock down CYP2C19, and they make the drug last three times longer. So there's a host of other interactions in your diet that can play a role. But this gave him um, sinus rhythm. And uh, it's been like that for now almost 16 months. But there has been a, a couple catches. Sanjay Gupta came in and demonstrated how well this is working in epilepsy, and suddenly the shelves dried out. And he went through three droughts. In all three droughts, his arrhythmias returned. Uh, so uh, this led him to finding more sources for this, which has not been uh, trivial. But he hasn't gone on to get his third degree black belt while on CBD. So there's one for uh, the prohibitionists. Um, uh, so it, it, all, all said and said, going, going from bradycardia and bedridden to be able to, to pass a third-degree black belt test, I think, is a really strong statement. But it is still an anecdote. It's a nan of one. And a lot of people will tell you that a collection of anecdotes is not data. However, I think as we're entering this personalized medicine field, what we're going to be faced with is a collection of anecdotes, a lot of private variants that are very specific to one person's disease. And they're going to be in purgatory for a while, waiting to find another patient that has their phenotype and their variant. Uh, so is there a possibly a way to prove this? Well, it's possible, but probably expensive. What we've been thinking about is harden a chip technology, where we can CRISPR and Cas9 modify the variants back to wild type, and then dose it with ethanol to see if we can actually reinduce a harden a chip rhythm problem. Um, there are some arguments why this might not work due to IPS technologies and where they are today, but George Church has a nice paper on this uh, with uh, Barr syndrome, so we're still keeping our eye on that. There's a handful of folks that were involved in this work because it was so complicated and controversial. We did uh, bring Raymond Brigada in. Uh, he's known for Brigada syndrome. Ralphie Matrulam discovered THC and has done a lot of the work, the cardiac work up there with THC. Uh, and Lester Grinspoon, who's, who's local and knows quite a bit about this field, and a few cardiologists in the, in the adjunct court team. But this really set us on a mission to relook at how do we get quality and safety testing, not just into epilepsy genetics, but on the plant that people are using. Because it was pretty clear from our experience that um, there's a lot of people selling snake oil right now, calling it hemp oil, uh, because there's such a high demand for people to use this in epilepsy. And the epileptic kids, uh, if you go back to the slide here, he was using 25 mg three times a day. He's about a 75 kilogram person. That's about a one micromolar dose. It's very low. The actual um, epileptic children are using five times that amount uh, for, their, for their weight. I mean, they're, they're really jacking this up to three to 600 milligrams uh, for these patients. And so uh, this is a very subtle amount, uh, but enough to be pharmaceutically active from what we've heard. Um, but even that small amount's hard to find because the epilepsy patients are needing so much of this. So this got us rethinking about how to bring more safety and quality testing into the cannabis field. And um, this led us back to some of the work we did before. Many people have seen this slide, but this is the reason why we want to bring this into a fast-growing cannabis field, is that this is one of the most explosive technologies that we can think of uh, that's going on today. If we can bring next-generation sequencing into one of the fastest-growing markets in, uh, in the United States, there's bound to be some opportunity there. And you'll notice something happened around 2010 and 2011 when NEB hired a bunch of technicians out of life tech. The price stopped changing. And that's all their fault. Like, <laughs> um, so uh, I, what we've done is the first thing we want to do is we need a peer-to-peer -peer system to share DNA throughout the field. We cannot move plant matter over state lines, even though it's federally, it's federally illegal, but it's recreationally legal in, in five states now. And uh, even up in Portland, Maine, I hear they went recreational. So DNA, we believe, can go across state lines as long as there's no THC in it. And if we can get DNA preps out there that can, that can enable that, we can get people to start sharing genetics. And that would be, uh, it would be a real help in the field. The other thing that, that they have been mandating 
and probably for good reason. There aren't a lot of recorded deaths uh, on people using cannabis. The, the only reported deaths there are for people who are immunocompromised who inhaled aspergillus uh, into their lungs. And so the thing, the cannabis won't kill you, but what grows on it might if you're immunocompromised. And so they've mandated mold and fungus testing uh, and bacteria testing in, uh, in several states now. And in fact, if you look at Colorado, they've mandated uh, every pound, every two pounds be tested. Uh, you got to take a gram out of every pound or two pounds and put it through a microbiome type of test where you test for E. coli, salmonella, bacteria, and, and uh, a variety of other um, yeast and molds. But they're doing about 240,000 pounds a year right now in Colorado alone, and it's growing 20% a year. So there's a large testing market in one state alone that's probably going to migrate to Washington and uh, Oregon and Alaska and D.C. as those things become live. Um, the other thing that's needed is, is sex testing in this field because the, this plant has male and female plants. It's dioshis. So when it actually, uh, when you plant the seed, you have a 50% chance it's going to be male or female. And the males, they aggressively get rid of. This is like Thelma and Louise on steroids, okay? They don't want males around at all because they pollinate the females, and the females end up stop making cannabinoids, and they start making seeds. And so can, you can destroy an entire grow with a single male plant. Now, there are 13 licensed, federally licensed grow facilities in Canada that have licenses to grow 60,000 plants at a time. One male plant at 60,000 plants, each of those plants are probably worth $1,000. It's a $60 million grow that a single plant can destroy. So they aggressively want to get rid of these, and the way they currently do this is they wait for them to grow four to eight weeks, and they run around the place looking for them and rip them out by eye. Now, if we have the Y chromosome, we can figure this out the moment we have it propping out of the ground. Um, so we're working on, on, on tests that can put all of this on a qPCR instrument. So the first ones that are coming out are yeast and mold, uh, a salmonella test and a coli test. They're a bit different. The yeast and mold, there's a tolerance of 10,000 CFUs per gram. The E. coli or, and salmonella are single CFU. And unfortunately, the regulations don't care if it's 0157. They just say any E. coli. So it's going to falsely fail a lot of material. Uh, there's coliform enterobacteria and then aspergillus. And the aspergillus one is probably very important because aflatoxin, in fact, requires CYP2C19 to be metabolized. And CBD turns that off, and it's, it's, a, it's a carcinogen. So um, they don't want to see any signs of this. And there are some games going on in the field where people will counterfeit traditional culture-based tests by just heating the material to 140 degrees and heat killing the bacteria. Okay, well, that might heat kill aspergillus. It's not going to heat kill the aflatoxin. And so the DNA sticks around through this, and this is one reason why we believe the PCR-based systems are, are a better approach. There's a couple of lyses you can use for these things, but it's a little bit, lyses can be dirty when you're grounding up plant matter and, and sticking antibodies to it. This is a very oily plant, so we're not very um, keen on the lyses. And then the other things in blue are XY testing, CBD and THC genetics, and some biome identification. We'll touch on a few of those uh, briefly. I think you guys know why you use PCR instead of Petri dishes. I won't spend much time there. I think, I think the important thing here to, to bring home, though, is that this is a case where a lack of a result equals safety. If there are no colonies on your plate, it equals safety. Okay, so that's, that's an engineering flaw where you need to have a positive control. You need to know that your, whatever you did to put on the Petri dish worked, and that's much easier to do with PCR. You can put in internal controls to know, like, look, the reaction worked. I didn't miss pipette. Um, the other thing that these labs aren't really used to is they're used to grinding up plant matter and running HPLCs. Uh, they're not used to amplifying anything, and microbiology amplifies your contaminant to measure it, it's just like PCR. So we're embedding a lot of the techniques that we've been working with NEB on to put methylated bases on these amplicons in qPCR so that, in fact, they're hydroxymethylated so that we can chew them up with ABS-1 and have very similar to a uracil decontamination system that makes material that we can then sequence. Uh, we haven't been going down the uracil road. Even though it's off patents, we, we haven't been able to cluster those things very well due to some polymerase limitations uh, on the MySeq. Um, so what we have instead of, of what you might find in the field is a biolumex system. This thing grows, and it measures in the tube a change in turbidity, and it measures a change in CO2, but it takes 48 hours for you to get answers, and we can do this in 20 cycles on a, on a, on a biorad. And we also have the benefit of having this internal control. That SCCG is a single copy cannabis gene. We sequence 12 cannabis genomes to find regions that were in the cannabinoid synthase pathway that were fairly stable, which is not easy to do. There's a lot of polymorphisms in this plant. But we targeted an amplicon that would be in every single assay, so we know the assay setup was right, and we have a positive control. And then we're targeting the ITS regions in yeast and mold. And there's a reason for wanting to target the ITS, which we'll touch on a little bit, but it's a nice microbiome tool in the end. 
Um, and then there are these species-specific tests where we have to have a single CFU, and this is for E. coli and salmonella, and, and we're just moving into enterobacteria, making sure that everything in that class we pick up with the same set of primers. Uh, these ones are a little bit more work because they're a broader class of, of, um, uh, of microbes. Um, so what folks can do if they get a positive result, the, the, the delta CTs can, can give you an estimate of the CFUs, but if you actually want to know what microbe it is, um, you actually want to sequence it. And that's important because most of the microbes in the plant are endophytes, like penicillin. These things are harmless, but they happen to grow in the plant, and if they're not there, you might get botrytis and other types of infections. So um, it's important to be able to not just enumerate, but to also identify. And so this is the reason why we selected the ITS region, uh, and we tailed these with alumina primers so that if people get a positive event, they can send back you know, these by the dozen, and we can load them all up in a MySeq, and get ourselves a nice uh, microbiome report that might look like this. And um, what's really interesting here is what we're starting to see is we can identify who, almost who grew it by the microbiome fingerprint. This one has magnetorth in it. So this came out of Holland. We know exactly where it came in Holland. It came from DNA genetics because they tend to always have magnetorth in, in, the, in the DNA they send us. Uh, if you flip this around to greenhouse seeds, you'll see different uh, organisms sitting in their grow room. Uh, so this has got folks interested in potentially looking at this for a surveillance system throughout the grow. Uh, you can imagine uh, sampling 100 plants in here every two or three weeks, and this may seem asinine to do if you're just growing tomatoes, but if each of these plants is $1,000 and you have you know, 60,000 of these under lights in Canada, running a couple plates of this uh, every other week to understand, hey, is anything cropping up that we need to take care of, you can go rip the plant out and not have to put pesticides on it per se. Uh, one of the challenges they have in the testing market is there's like 200 pesticides that are not allowed and they have to test for. So a lot of these testing labs have, have some pretty expensive mass, mass spec equipment to deal with the pesticide side of the testing. Um, folks that we've been talking to would rather just screen and rip them out than have to go and treat the entire room and deal with pesticide testing later. So uh, it's, uh, it's, an opening, uh, it's opening up, a, we think, an interesting new field to bring some of these microbiome things into, uh, uh, into these uh, very large-scale industrial grows. Um, so when folks want to do large-scale industrial grows, they do not do crosses and plant them and rip, off, and rip out all the males. Uh, the reason they don't do that uh, is, is because this is a, uh, is a real complicating problem. What they'll do is once they find a strain that they like, they'll go into a cloning operation, and they'll clone that plant. Uh, that way they don't have this problem with males popping up everywhere. If they ever want to make a new strain, like one that has high in CBD because that's in high demand right now, they have to go through a breeding process and plant seeds and screen them, and that process can take 12 weeks. Uh, now, they want to get the males out of there pretty quickly, and as I mentioned earlier, the way this was traditionally done was with an assay that was published by Mandolino back in 2004, but there is one single band here that tells you whether you're male or not, and that you can tell this is a pretty sloppy banding system to look at. Uh, I wouldn't want to be evaluating it if it, if it have had that many plants on the line, um, staring at uh, bands, and it's not very minimal to qPCR because every single one of them produces a product. Um, so we cloned these products and sequenced them to figure out what was going on, and then we, we went and sequenced a couple males, and like, an interesting hint that was in their paper was that this is a MAD C2 repeat construct. So targeting a repeat as a tool I just I have some problems with. It, it, it worries me that it's not going to be um, consistent. And from our estimates in sequencing a few male genomes, this is a couple hundred copies per chromosome, and there happens to be one particular set of SNPs on the male Y chromosome that makes this work. So there's, you can see on the right side here, we have, first off, um, this is the 30X male genome, and when we align to this region, we get 17,000X. Now, granted, this is aligned with some loose uh, criteria to try and understand what was going on, but you can see multiple different SNPs in the reverse primer. There's only one paired read across the whole region. And on the other end, there is a three-prime SNP on that read. Uh, so it appears this is working because of one base on one primer to determine male or female. And we decided that what we'd rather do is take all of the female sequences that we have, take all the male sequences we have, align them against the females, everything that was left over and unaligned, assemble those into a putative set of Y contigs, and then design qPCR assays for those contigs, and graduate those in to the laboratory and see what we can find. So this was pretty easy to do with just a, a SAGE system and, and Nextera libraries. We just ran through this. And this was published as a technique in Lotus. They didn't have a reference for Lotus, so they used, uh, they compensated for that by having more plants and they did a, a very clever Kamer approach here. But, but they were actually able to, with even some RNA-seq on top of this, nail the sex determining loci, which is really interesting. 
Uh, now, we can't be certain that we've nailed the sex-determining locus. We just know that we have a binary answer uh, that's, that's male-specific right now. And we've run this across uh, nine samples now that are male and about 20 that are female, and we haven't had any, uh, any discordance yet. But it's a much cleaner answer than what we were seeing with the Mandolino set of primers because those are very temperature sensitive, as you might imagine, and the gradients were, um, were giving us multiple, multiple bands. We then converted this into a multiplex assay that again has our internal positive control, and you get a signal if there's a Y, and you don't get a signal if, if, if it's a female. And so this is ready to go out uh, and it be expanded onto many more male samples. We've only got, as I mentioned earlier, nine males and 20 females, but we think it's going to be a more reliable marker for qPCR for, for picking up X and Y. And we could potentially do that with a leaf cutting. Just a, a hole punch on a leaf will be able to get that type of information. Now, the other bit of information we think people are going to need at a very early age, at the seedling stage, is whether the plant's going to go down a route of generating THC or CBD. These genes are linked. They're in some type of um, a linkage just equilibrium in the genome because they have found that you tend to get one of three genotypes with these plants. You tend to get things that make a lot of THC. They're a hybrid where they make 50-50 of THC or CBD, or they make all CBD. Now, the actual magnitude on that axis of how much CBD or THC they, they make, another publication has shown that a couple SNPs impact uh, whether you end up being a 25% plant or a 12% plant. Uh, but this particular promoter region that um, Mandolino once again has described, uh, we've gone about, when he described this, he didn't provide the sequences, he just provided some nice primers. We've then cloned those primers after they've been amplified and sequenced them to see what's going on. And we're starting to build uh, assays that would pick this up as well, qPCR. So you can imagine getting a leaf punch very early on, knowing if it's going to be male, female, or CBD and THC, uh, just off of a multiplex Q qPCR assay. And we will probably go in later and make some SNP-specific um, uh, assays as well to cover Sierra Cantaramus's work, where they showed that you can get very different amounts of THC synthase activity based on certain SNPs that are in, in the FAD, FAD binding domain of that enzyme. So there's a lot of genetics here that could be very helpful for, for breeders and marker-assisted selection. Um, these are just some of these peaks from high CBD plants and high THC plants. We can actually clone these, sequence them, and design um, assays for them. And those are, under, those are under design right now, so those should be probably available in the summertime. Um, now, the final thing, and some of the most, one of the biggest things that's plaguing the field is that there is no trademarking in this field, and I don't place any judgment on there other than you can't go to the USPTO with a, with a trademark, and people are renaming plant strains all the time. Many of you may have heard that the, the Marley family just announced that they're going to do a Marley natural strain of cannabis, and they're probably going to get three times the price of anything else, and whenever someone runs out of it, they're just going to rename that strain Marley natural and sell it. Uh, and that happens all the time in the field, and the genetic screening that's been done in the field has shown that people are relabeling to whatever they can get the highest value to. So the chain of custody here can be solved with genetics. A lot of people have asked for DNA fingerprints. So where do you put DNA fingerprints of a plant that the trademark office won't accept? Uh, we've decided uh, the best place is not necessarily NCBI for this, but to actually load these things into a, the Bitcoin blockchain because the Bitcoin blockchain instantly takes data and replicates it to a million different computers at once, and it's the largest supercomputer homing there is right now, and it has a financial motive to exist of a couple billion dollars of transactions going on every day. So this is a very um, uh, interesting play that we're thinking about doing, where we would take a RADSeq library to get us maybe 100,000 SNPs off the genome. We would take those, we'd use those SNPs to, use, to draw a phylogenetic map, and uh, also just as a sort of general fingerprint for that strain. And then if folks wanted to submit this with any meta information, we would help them submit a entry into a Bitcoin blockchain that would prove that this data exists at a particular time. Why would people want to do this? Well, if um, this is an easy approach to go, same similar slide as doing RADSeq. Um, why people want to do this is there is a motivation in the field for people to say, look, I, I just created a new strain. I want to you know, publicly declare that it's mine and I want to share its genetics so that anything that's ever shown up again, we can say whether it was derivative of that or not. And there's a bit of a first to file incentive here, perhaps from a bragging right perspective, that hey, we created a new strain and we're the first to do it, and the first person who puts Marley Natural in here, every other strain that ever gets genotyped will get compared to that as a genesis block, and the phylogenetic trees will be based on whoever was first to file. Um, so this is, uh, we don't know, if you go to look, to the, look into the blockchain currently, you won't see us submitting ATCs and Gs there. It doesn't accept data that way. It, it accepts a hash digest of that data, which is an encrypted form of, uh, 
uh, of communication, which is very interesting because it will be immortalized in an encrypted way and the public and private keys can be turned either public or private. So people can submit data here and only they can look at it or they can choose to open this up for the entire world uh, to use it. We don't own this database, so no one can buy us and shut it down. Uh, this database will be on public record and, and uh, constantly holding a phylogenetic tree of all the species. Uh, and the reason for doing this, uh, we believe it's important to have it be uh, a proof of existence and for it to be open source. Because in other words, we don't think it's going to get used. We think if you are a private company claiming that you're going to own all the cannabis genetics, no one's going to send you anything. Uh, frankly, there's too much distrust. So uh, I think everyone wants to see it be a public record that everyone can compare their strains and their genetics and we can know for certainty what, it, what are the genetics going around in the field. So. Um, we're hopeful it will pan out, but again, it's a bit of a, uh, it's a, bit of a gamble there. Uh, the, 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 the main tool that is going out live already today, and we're installing this in, in MCR laboratories, is just a DNA prep that gets us 50 to 100 nanograms of DNA out of a very simple, quick prep with magnetic beads. And this can get us 10 PCR reactions or two genomes off of a prep. Uh, and uh, it's, it's gauged to work with all of those mold, uh, mold testing techniques. But it's very field portable. You can do this on your, on your kitchen counter if you had to. Uh, and it generates very nice Nextera libraries for sequencing, and we know it has absolutely no cannabinoids in it, so we believe it's safe to go in the mail. Um, so there's a handful of folks that jumped on this as well. Uh, there's uh, a few folks from the Solo team, you might recall, uh, that have jumped on here and helped us get all these assays up and running. Uh, we've had a lot of helpful communication from, from MCR, Workshop, Tilray, and of course the people here at New England Biolabs have helped us design many of these assays uh, for qPCR. And uh, it's been a great collaboration because we've been able to pound through four or five different assays in six months, and uh, it's all been working very well. Um, and we've had some other esoteric forms of funding here. We've had a few reggae bands help us out, which has been really fun. They, uh, they gave us free music and helped promote a, an iPad app that we got a, probably enough money off this iPad app to sequence uh, a couple other genomes uh, off of it. So it doesn't say much because genomes are so cheap to sequence these days. But, um, and there have been some people throwing uh, bitcoins around at us for, for some of the work, but it's all, uh, I think it's all more like a tipping jar than anything else. Um, so with that, I'll just leave it for questions. Great play on words. Um, yeah, so um, males, males don't generate any flowers, and flowers are, is the bud. That's what everyone wants for either consumption of, for, for recreation or for generating CBD. So um, if the male ever pollinates a female, the, the female quickly shifts from making flowers to making seeds. And so its cannabinoid content plummets, and then it starts to contaminate the flowers with seeds, and then people have to de-seed that, that low cannabinoid content flower. So uh, they're petrified of having males uh, because one male can pollinate an entire grow room, and suddenly a very valuable crop has now turned into something you have to throw away. Uh, so they aggressively have to go after these, and they do it visually currently. And the real challenge doing it visually is that the male sex organs can pop up in 24 hours. So if you're not paying close attention, it, they can pop up and start pollinating uh, if you went away for a weekend. Uh, so they have to aggressively look at these things during a, a, a pretty broad window, four to, four to eight weeks. They're running around looking at all their plants to make sure none of them are male. It, 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 this is true, but once you have a plant that you like, you can clone about 100 of them in 10 days by, by clipping off uh, a leaf and replanting it. So when they find one they like, a female, they start cloning it. And now there's, there's a hybrid vigor issue here. If they clone like six generations, uh, they, they start to get stunted. And then they go back to doing crosses and finding females and then, and then repeating this. So the cloning process only, go, only takes you so many generations before they start to get stunted. Uh, right in back. Yes. Yes. 
Yes, and that's a big debate in the field as to, um, so you know, the FDA-based model likes to isolate things into single drugs and test them. And uh, when you start getting into, you know, polypharmacy like this, the, the models fall apart. Uh, and there's a lot of literature on what you're talking about, which is called the entourage effect. Uh, if you have a plant that's high in myrcene, which is a terpene that comes through in some of these plants, that's an agonist for the CD1 receptor, and so it tends to potentiate the effect of THC. Um, there's other terpenes that do the opposite as well. You'll find some in black peppers that will actually be an antagonist to CD1 and offset uh, any of the any of the high. So, um, it's a, yeah, it is a complicated space on simplifying it. Now, the genetics for the other cannabinoids aren't as well understood. GW is probably the furthest on this, but as you mentioned, there's um, if you can recall the THC structure, there's a there's a there's a pentyl carbon string on the on the end of it. And there's propyl versions of this side chain that occur naturally in the plant that are called varins, or THCV, or CBDV, and they have completely different pharmaceutical properties just by moving those two carbons. Um, the plant makes everything also carboxylated, uh, so it's only if you heat THCA does it turn into THC. So actually, if you take raw plants and squeeze all the THC out of it into an oil and give it to kids, they will not have a psychoactive effect unless you heat it. Uh, so those compounds have even different pharmacology. So there, there is a, this is a very interesting pharmaceutical repertoire. I, I mean, I liken it to people saying, look, this is like Pfizer going open source, over the counter tomorrow. Because there's an enormous pharmaceutical repertoire in here that's soon going to be over the counter, and we need to tie this into personal genetics somehow. Because there's too much potential to just uh, have everyone grind this up as a bowl and smoke it. It's not going to go that way. For some, of these, for some of these patients, they need to basically take it as an oil to get the dosage right. You cannot give somebody 75 milligrams of THC without them probably jumping out a window. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tremendous amount of, of THC. You'll usually see personal doses in Colorado at 5 to 10 milligrams. Um, and yet, the epilepsy patients need it at that level, and they don't want it to be psychoactive. So they have to think about exactly what you're saying, is how do we combine this so it's not psychoactive, uh, so that patients can get a high enough dose. I think there's another question right over here. There, I think there's going to be an enormous market there, and the males may matter there because uh, they may grow stock, and uh, they may be easier to actually flesh out. And I think there's going to be marker-assisted selection activity there, too, to try and find completely different properties that make oil. In that case, you want seeds if you want to get oil out of the plant. Um, and uh, there's probably other properties that we're not even looking at, and th that's an enormous market. That's a market that, uh, if it if it gets legalized, you can see the whole fiber and paper industry turning over to a hemp-based solution because it's apparently four times more efficient per acre. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so it depends on the route of administration. If you consume it through smoking, it will bypass the liver, uh, and you'll get a different effect. Uh, if you eat it orally, it will go through your liver and have an impact on some of... Uh, now, Keppra happens to be... It doesn't have a lot of drug-drug interactions, so we don't worry so much about that one. Um, but what is important to know is when it goes through your liver, particularly THC, it gets eight times more psychoactive. It gets converted into 11-hydroxy-THC which doesn't happen if you inhale it. It happens only if you eat it. So this is why some people have some very unexpected results when they eat it, is they don't gauge this correctly. They might have a grapefruit juice with it, and bang, um, it's uh, much more much stronger than they anticipated. Um, but other antileptic drugs you do need to worry about. You need to worry about clobazam in particular and carbamazepine. Those two um, are interfering with the same pathway that metabolizes THC and CBD. So there, there is a very active, um, it's a good point. So we, we haven't been getting patients of that flavor just based on um, we, the, the way that we're selling our tests are into uh, epileptologists who probably aren't handling psychiatric cases like schizophrenia. But there's a lot of data on Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and schizophrenia having the endocannabinoid system play a, a very important role. Um, there's a paper that came out just this week showing that low dosages of cannabidiol 
have a bigger impact um, on uh, Alzheimer's disease and THC. Everyone was focusing on THC for Alzheimer's for a while, and this paper kind of changed that and suggested that the CD2 receptors are, are more pertinent. Um, so for those who aren't familiar, the two dominant cannabinoid receptors that are out there, there's CD1, which is responsible for, uh, for the euphoria and is mostly in the brain, and there's CD2 that's in your immune system. And the interesting thing about cannabidiol is it doesn't hit CB1, it does hit CB2, uh, but it tends to limit neuroinflammation. And neuroinflammation has been really the focus of what it might be going on with CBD and epilepsy. That when the, when the, this is why some kids, when they, very rare instances when people get some vaccines, they get, they get febrile seizures. It's because it, it boosts the immune system and they get a little bit more neuroinflammation and they end up seeing seizures pop out. They think a lot of what's going on in Gervais syndrome is in fact a neuroinflammation event and that CBD is actually just dampening that down. Um, so we think there's gonna be a, a role in these other psychiatric diseases that, are, that, are, uh, that may have a similar effect. They may, if they're grounded in a neuroinflammation, then uh, it may play a role. Uh, there are clinical trials that are also going on studying uh, Parkinson's and schizophrenia right now through GW Pharmaceuticals. It's, it's uh, only been found in the cannabis plants, and there's one other contested one, a flower in, I think, South Africa that, um, uh, that a group is looking at. It, it, it's not an identical compound. They just think it may actually, if you tritiate it, it may stick to a, CD, a CD1 receptor. But um, no, they're, it's, they're fairly unique in their ability to make these compounds. What is common in the plant kingdom are terpenes. Yeah, uh, and they, this plant will make a, a, up, up, upwards to 100 different terpenes, usually 12 dominant ones that you'll find in most strains. Um, but the terpenes are throughout almost the whole plant kingdom. You'll see there's probably 40 different ones in, in grapes. And uh, the reason I, I connect that to the, the cannabinoids is that they are the precursor to make a cannabinoid. It basically folds two terpenes together to make a cannabinoid. That, so that's the holy grail. People, um, there are companies starting to do that, uh, to try to take the artemisinin approach, where you clone the whole pathway into yeast. Um, when they clone TH, a, a Japanese group cloned just THC synthase into yeast and tried to get it to express, and it got up to about three to four percent before it became an antiseptic, and ended up killing the yeast. Um, and so this, there, there might be some challenges in doing this because we think the plant may have evolved these things actually as a way of controlling its microbiome and being a pesticide. Uh, so they can be fairly cytotoxic uh, to, to microbes, and they also believe that's what's happening in cancer. There have been some connections to these working in cancer because they are pro-apoptotic for, for cells that are growing very quickly. Uh, and uh, the mechanism of there is not completely understood, but um, there may be a challenge getting them through a synthetic biology route without solving that problem. Yes, and it's a great question because they have and they've been to market under the trade name Marinol. Um, you have to be, they're, they're often, when they're done synthetically, they're racemic. Um, the plant is stereospecific, specific, uh, so there's, there's a minor issue there. Uh, but as the other gentleman asked, people have not been reporting the same response rate when they take individual compounds. Uh, and Marinol was something that you swallowed. So people had this uh, kind of erratic response based on their diet, I think, uh, that they would get either overly dosed or, or underdosed because they couldn't judge getting it through their GI. Um, so I, I think some of these other compounds of the plant may aid in, in managing that, um, or they'll find other routes of administration. They're seeing a lot of work being done transdermally right now. They're making like nicotine patches, except with THC or CBD in them, and those go venously through your skin, and uh, it's a much smoother uh, or more predictable um, dosage path and then going through your liver. All right. Thank you. Great, thank you. <laughs> hmm? It is. Oh, the initials. Yeah. yeah, I should pull that out. He's consented, but. <laughs> yeah. That's. Um, <laughs> I'll just go use the soap now.